Hello and welcome to this CoreLogix training video on events to metrics. Events to metrics allow you to turn logs or spans into metrics. Now, why would you do this? It's simple. Metrics are very, very easy to hold on to for a very long time. They don't cost very much money to retain and they can be queried in a very, 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 very performant way and over very, very long periods of time. So this unlocks that really important historical reporting capability without the really expensive need to index all of your data for a really, really long time. Now, in CoreLogix, you can turn logs or spans into metrics. And the reason for this, obviously, metrics are already in that form. Now, it's important to mention that there are some key prerequisites uh, with the logs to metrics and events to metrics uh, functionality. You need to have a metrics bucket set up. And the way you do that, you go to Dataflow, and you can go down to your uh, setup archive. In setup archive, you'll see a CX data bucket here. And you'll also see a configure metrics bucket. You need to have a running configure metrics bucket in order for events to metrics to work because your metrics are actually stored in cloud storage, for example, in S3 and other cloud storage providers as well on different cloud platforms. This enables you to uh, maintain really, really low retention costs, almost nothing retention costs. Um, but because of the CoreLogix platform, because of the query engine, the queries are extremely fast. So this is just a basic run through of what um, events to metrics is, on what it's comprised of and why you would want to use it. Again, it's a really, really powerful cost optimization technique that enables um, huge cost savings while retaining key information over a really, really long period of time. And the beauty of CoreLogix, the power of CoreLogix, is that because of the TCO optimizer, you never need to index your data in the first place. You can ingest your logs and traces as monitoring data. They're never indexed, but they're still converted into metrics. So you never pay for that really expensive indexing for your logs or your traces. This is just the real power of CoreLogix there. So next we're going to take a look at a worked example of some logs and some spans and how they look when they're converted into metrics using the events to metrics functionality. And then we're going to explore um, all of the different features that are available as part of events to metrics so that by the end of this video, you're really, really familiar with how to create uh, metrics from the key information that you need and the best ways to go about it and some things to avoid, some common problems that people run into. So let's get started. Let's explore logs to metrics and spans to metrics under the events to metrics category. We'll begin with logs. I'm in the log explore view here and I have filtered by any logs that have the field json.http response took ms. So I've run the query and if I scroll down, I can see uh, that helpfully it's highlighted the fields that have been captured by the query. Now I can see this is HTTP response took MS and it's 31 milliseconds. This exists for a great number of different logs. So um, in the last 15 minutes, there's like 9,000 of them. So we can, there's a few thousand coming through. So what we can do is we can define an events to metrics um, category that will actually capture the HTTP response took MS. And so I already got one here. This is the load time events to metric. Note this is the name of the events to metric, but not necessarily the name of the metric field. And so what we do, we can then extract different field values from the logs that are captured. So here, this is just capturing all logs. It's not worrying too much about it. And it's saying, okay, load time metric, which is the actual name of the metric series now is load time. And if I look here, I can see HTTP response took MS. So now I've identified that field that we've seen in the logs, this one here. I've captured it here, and when I press save, what will happen is that metric series will start to be generated from that particular field. And you can actually see that in action in this custom dashboard here. So we have different latencies for each of these fields, which is quite nice. And if we click on one of these here and move myself out of the way, you can see in the bottom left, we have that load time uh, metric series. So you can see a really nice example here of generating a series of metrics from a particular field found in a log. So what does it look like for spans? It's very, very similar. Let's go to tracing. I'm in the, I'm in the uh, tracing view for a specific trace. I can see all of the spans that make up that trace. I can highlight any of these. Now on any of these, I will see a duration field here. Uh, it's quite nice actually. So I can see the duration field, the duration for this particular transaction within the whole trace took 13.93 milliseconds, which made up 5.17% of the entire um, interaction, the entire trace, which is really nice actually, because you can see where the pain points are. Um, so we're in the dependencies view right now. So what this means is that, okay, every single trace, every single span has a duration on it. So I can actually extract that. I can extract spans from all of my traces, turn them into metrics, and then drop the original traces. And so keep the, essentially the key piece of information here is this service talked to this service and it took this long. And we can keep historical information across all of our spans. So this isn't just 
honing on a specific application. We're keeping essential information about everything, but we can retain it for a default of a year, but as long as we want, really. Um, we lose um, whichever fields we don't capture as labels, and we can talk more about that later, but we can look at how we can convert that. So you can see here, we go back to events to metrics. We now have a span duration event to metric. Again, the name of the event to metric, not necessarily the name of the metric series. We go down here and we've got this uh, metric series named duration MS, and it comes from duration. Now you can see that the event source is spans here. We can filter by more values, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, services and actions. But you can see here all of the different tags that exist on a given span. So you can see all of these different values down here. You can add you can add these and you can, you can pull any value you want out of these. We just pick duration because it's the most obvious. And then we've added some labels as well, like service name and operation name and hotel status code. And that's impacted the permutations, which again, we'll talk about, talk about permutations in, in a lot of detail because that can be quite a confusing part of this. But what we've done here is essentially we've created a cross-cutting metric that captures all of the exchanges that are happening across our entire system and retain them for as long as we like with highly performant queries. And again, that manifests itself like this. So we've got this really nice um, dashboard that's based on the spans that have been generated, um, on the spans that are now are generated into metrics. So again, if I click on here, move myself out of the way, duration, MS, CX average. So you can see here, this is the average speed for each of the different um, values. And again, this is really, really nice because it means that I still have visibility of all the different services that are talking to one another in my system, but I'm not paying for that really long-term uh, span retention. This is a really, really powerful use case just to indicate uh, why spans to metric, why logs to metrics and under the events to metrics category is just so fantastic. Okay, let's explore how to create an events to metric feature. So uh, the way to do it, hover over data flow, go down to events to metrics. This will bring the dashboard and the list of all the different events to metrics you have set up. Click on new events to metric. The first thing you'll see right at the top, the basic details. This is the name and the description. Note this name doesn't have an impact on the metric field names that you generate. So this name is just for the configuration, uh, just to store the configuration. It doesn't impact the name of the fields, um, the actual name of the metric fields themselves. A description, obviously, so you can call it my E2M, for example, whatever you want. Now you have two options here, logs or spans. I'll go through a worked example with logs, but I just want to highlight the difference between logs and spans. With logs, you um, in, in you have a query, you have scope and subsystem, or application and subsystem, and severity. For spans, it's slightly different. Um, there's no severity anymore because spans don't really have a severity. Um, you have application subsystem. You also have service and action. Action is typically the endpoint that the span refers to, and service is the actual service that generated the span in the first place. Everything else is the same, okay? So you pull fields from the span in the same way. You attach labels from the, from the fields attached to the span in the same way. You have permutations to consider in the exact same way. So let's go through a worked example with the logs now. To start with, um, you can just write a Lucene query here. For example, anything there. So for example, json.http, you know, uh, resp tuck ms. There you go. So you can just see that that will now query for anything with this field present. Then you can look for applications and subsystems. You can add specific apps here. So I can take my AWS Lambda and I can lock onto the cart service subsystem as well. What this allows me to do is to make very, very specific uh, queries. Now, it's always better to make specific queries. This just avoids any potential slowdown. Remember, if you're making these massive queries and trying to generate metrics from them, that's more that the platform has to search through. So a nice specific query will mean guaranteed 60 second granularity, really fast, really short um, time to generate that metric. It'll just remove any possibility of latency. So strongly, strongly recommend that you uh, make a more specific query rather than a general query. Of course, you can select severity as well. So it's, it's just better to fill all this in as much as possible. I'll set these back to all just for the sake of ease. Now for metric fields, you can declare up to 10 different metric fields. Now, um, what is, how does a metric field work? I'll give you an example. If I make a metric field that's like this, I will now have a metric series called my E2M metric. And I can decide where that comes from. So for example, um, I'm checking for that HTTP response talk time. So let's just talk MS. So now what I'm saying is that I have a field metric, uh, metric name, uh, my E2M metric that now has the value of whatever is in this. It's really important when you're selecting the field uh, from your log, it has to be a true numeric value. 
So it has to be numeric in the sense that it appears in the schema here as a number, but also it has to be a, a, a value that you want to do mathematics with. So for example, if you have an ID that's completely numeric, it doesn't really make sense to divide two IDs by one another. Rather, um, it's better to have a number like latency or error rate or anything like that, something that you wish to do mathematics with. So just think, am I picking the right value here? If it's numeric, if it's a true numeric value. If we open up advanced here, you'll see that we have um, a bunch of different options. So we have a bunch of default aggregations that happen, max, min, count, average, sum, and the samples that are generated as well. If I remove these, I can decide which metric fields are actually generated. You'll see here that we have my E2M metric, that's the name, and then it will be suffixed with CX max, CX min, CX count. These are all different metric series. It's really nice because rather than having to constantly write max queries or constantly average things or whatever, you just have the series doing it for you already. It's a really, really nice option. For histograms, histograms are great. You can just type in, for example, 95th and 99. This will get you the 95th percentile and the 99th percentile of the data as well. Super powerful for SRE use cases, tracking SLOs and SLIs. Remember, you can have up to 10 of these. If you define none of these, you're going to get a really basic um, a metric. And all it does, the only thing that it does, is it will um, have a count of the number of logs that match this query every 60 seconds. Um, and it will be named after this, so like my E2M CX logs count, or docs count. And this, this is useful to see uh, how many logs are being hit by your uh, events metric, but just be aware of that. So it's almost always the case that you want to generate some metric fields. Now for your labels, um, your labels are essentially values that you wish to add to your metrics. Now for labels, you need to be, you need to be aware of a few things. Labels are essentially like your indexes, for your metrics. So for example, one could choose um, continent and add the continent name. And that's really useful if you think you're going to be grouping the metrics by continent, querying and filtering by continent and so on. If you never wish to make that query or you never wish to do that slice, there's no point adding these labels. Be really aware of this because it has an implication as well to the number of um, permutations that you'll use as well. So you can see an example here where um, what I'm essentially saying is, okay, we'll slice by consonant, and we'll do this. What this actually means, really interesting, there's only one consonant value, it seems, in the past seven days. So you only have a permutation of one. Now, what that means is that there's only one different value here. Now, the problem with these permutations is that they can go up and they can explode. So be really aware of this. We'll do a section towards the end of the video that will explain permutations in some more detail. But just be aware that um, it will... Uh, it, it can explode the number of labels that you've got and that can be quite um, quite difficult. So have a look at this graph and have a look at how many metrics are being, how many permutations are being used per day and then that will inform the value that you put in there. Now, once again with your labels, just be really aware that um, the labels are, are essentially your indexes, they're how you can query and slice your data. So just be on top of that um, and, and think up front, okay, I wish to query by continent or country or IP address or host or cloud provider or, or whatever and think about how you're going to use this data because it's going to inform how you define your labels. So just to recap uh, what we've gone through, we've covered the basic details, we've covered the difference between logs and spans, remember you've got those extra two services and actions there. Um, we've shown how to define queries and once again always better to have very specific query scope and severity in there, same thing with spans, always better to have query and scope as really really specific as possible. Uh, we've gone through metric fields and what happens if you don't define any metric fields versus what, what you get if you do define some metric fields. And of course, the best fields from your logs to actually take true numeric values. And then we've uh, gone over the labels field as well and explained why labels are really useful and really powerful. So um, that's just a recap, and a, a run through of how to, how to actually create uh, events to metrics in the CoreLogix platform. Let's quickly explore permutations because they can be a problem when people are working with the events to metric tool. So we just want to make sure people completely understand them. So we can see here that what I'm in is the uh, span duration. So it's a span to metric uh, configuration. I'm going to bring all the logs. I've developed, I've defined a single metric field, duration MS. Now when I go on to labels here, I can see some stuff. So I've made three labels for my, uh, for each of my metric series, service, action, and error. Now, this means that per day, I'm generating 107, 108, roughly 106 different permutations per day. Now, 
What does this mean? This means that there are 106 different combinations of the unique values of service, action, and error. Okay, so if if you have like five services and uh, three actions, then you have to draw a line between each of the five services and each of the three actions, in which case there would be 15. Um, and then on top of that, if there are like, I don't know, 10 different errors, then each of those 15 permutations also now have to line up to another 10. And it kind of explodes a little bit. So what, what you need to be able to do is say, okay, uh, but it's, it's tricky to work out, but this is why we have this graph below that actually shows the permutations per day. This will give you some idea of, um, of how many permutations are going to be used by a given metric. So just to illustrate how quickly these things can blow up, let's say I make um, a label called thread name. So there should be a tag thread name here. And I hit refresh. When I add a new field or add a new label here, I hit refresh. And that, that means that the application is going to go and look uh, for the past week and see how many permutations there are. And you can see that by just adding thread name, I've increased everything by a factor of 10. So you can see these things can blow up. If I was to add another one, it might increase it by a factor of 10 again and again and again and again. So the reason why permutations can be confusing is because you can obviously run into your 10 million permutations per account limit. So what I would recommend is um, when you're thinking about your labels, think, do they have lots of unique values? Um, and if they do have lots of unique values, then um, how many of those am I going to be adding in? And make use of this metrics permutations graph so you completely understand um, how much, uh, how many metrics you're going to be generating. Um, and then you can allocate the number of permutations for this particular account. So there's like 1,100 a day, 1,200, 1,100, 1,100, and so on, which means 30,000 is probably a comfortable number. So what you should do is step one, add the labels you, you want and don't worry about permutations. Refresh, look at what that's going to do to your daily permutation rate and think, okay, what's my budget for permutations? Well, I have 9.3 million left. So yeah, fine, let's go nuts. If your budget's a little bit lower, then maybe think, okay, do I need this label? Can I find a more efficient way of getting this label and so on? So that's just a quick word on permutations because it can get a little bit confusing and a bit difficult. Uh, but hopefully this explains and gives you some tools for how to balance the number of labels and the number of high cardinality labels versus the number of permutations and the budget of permutations you've got in your CoreLogix account. So just to wrap up, We've explored how to configure events and metrics, uh, how to set the query, the scope, uh, severities for logs, and how to set the services and actions for given spans, um, how to set the different values um, in the metrics fields, uh, you have the limitations you have there, you know, obviously the limit of 10 metrics field per event and metrics, and how to set the labels as well. You can also see the number of metric permutations as well here, and the, why the metric permutations are really, really important. We've also looked at the before and after, um, so you can see how um, how different events to metrics are actually generated and what that actually means for your dashboarding and for your graphing. So you see in CoreLogix custom dashboards, we can see uh, spans to metrics being used here to visualize data over a long period of time. And we've discussed the benefits. So quickly highlight the benefits. Very, very cost effective to keep a hold of this data. It's held in object storage in your cloud account. Um, again, that means the prerequisite is that you have your metrics archive set up. So make sure you have that before you embark on your events to metrics mission. Um, and then most importantly, it doesn't have any additional cost impact whatsoever. So you can generate as much data as you like. So this is a direct one way uh, to saving money, uh, but also maintaining that crucial insight and adding powerful high performance uh, historical perception to your data, gives you a whole new insight into your information.